Hello. Nice to meet you. How are you? How are you? I thought you weren't going to be here. Good morning. Can you all hear a little bit? Yeah? Okay. And hopefully online you can hear us too. This is our first time having a, they call this a hybrid gathering, where some people are online and some people are here. We're excited to have folks with us. And you all can, you can spread out. You can come over into this area a little bit too. Just want to keep the camera clear for our folks who are joining us. Friends, grace and peace from Jesus Christ, our Lord. And also, it's, I should add, we have a bulletin this morning because we're interactive. And unlike when you're solely at home, I can tell if you're not, if you're, if you're not <laughs> interacting. So hopefully, again, hopefully you can hear. And Lottie's going to be the, Lottie or I will always be the voice of the people. So we'll be loud too. Great. Grace and peace from Jesus Christ, our Lord. And also with you. Beloved people of God, on this most holy morning, when our Savior Jesus Christ passed from death to life, we gather with the church throughout the world. This is the Passover of our Lord Jesus Christ. Through the light, light and, and the word and, and through, through the, the water, water we, we proclaim, proclaim Christ's, Christ's death and resurrection. resurrection. We, we share Christ's triumph over sin and death, and, and we, we await, await Christ's, Christ's coming again in glory. glory. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word, the Word was, was God. God. The life of Christ is the light of all people. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness does not overcome it. Eternal God, in Jesus Christ you have given the light of life to all the world. Bless this new fire and kindle in us the desire to shine with the brightness of Christ rising until we feast at the banquet of eternal light. Through the Son of Righteousness, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Amen. Some fires take a little time. <laughs> we'll give it a moment. Eric, over on my side, you might be able to get in. Is there in. a little more flame mm -hmm. there? Okay. There's some flame. Hmm. 
my finger is a glow. The light of Christ rises in glory, casting out the shadows of sin and death. Christ is risen. Christ is risen indeed. Christ is risen. <laughs> Christ is risen indeed. Christ is risen. Christ is risen indeed. Amen. Amen. Friends, we are celebrating this Easter morning using a tradition that is an ancient tradition of the church. It's one of the earliest traditions of the church. It's often the, called the Easter Vigil. The Easter Vigil because it starts in the darkness. Now, some churches have modified it and they'll do it on Saturday afternoon. And it's odd because you start in the light and leave in the darkness. But the real intention is that we start in the darkness. And why do we start in the darkness? I mentioned the other day that this is part of a three day, the three days, the triduum, the three days of worship that is a continuous service of worship from that night where Christ said goodbye, where Christ gave the new mandate, stretching all the way through to this moment. And it continues because we see it as one movement of worship, one movement from Christ giving this commandment to love through Christ's death and into this resurrection moment. And so there is, there is some great importance for us to be continuing the work that we did at Good Friday as we proceed now to this point of Easter. And so as the light comes up, and you'll see the sun make its way up tonight, and look at our fire is robust now, isn't it? Um, as we see the, the sun come up, ushering in the newness of the good news, at the Easter vigil we gather, we start this new fire, recognizing Christ's constant presence in our lives, but Christ's return in this moment as the Christ candle is lit. There are readings that are traditionally used at a service of uh, Easter Vigil. There are a lot of them. If you've ever been to a traditional Easter Vigil service, you're there for a while, because each of these readings, primarily from the Old Testament, are read in full. We're not doing that today. Uh, you can choose to go back to your Bibles and read all of these readings. But today, I want to walk you through these texts, though, and remind us all, remind us all of where God's story has gone, where God's story started in humanity, in the, for the course of humanity, and where God's story has gone. Some of these texts are very familiar to you, like God breathing life into creation in Genesis. God saying, I am bringing life to this world. I'm creating humankind in the image of God. And then we recount the story of Noah, of God's covenant with God's people after the great flood, signified by a rainbow in the sky, and this promise to Noah that God will always love God's people. Then there's the, the testing of Abraham, where God showed that Abraham's obedience to God would make Abraham blessed so that he could be a blessing. Blessed so that he could be a blessing, and that, and that he and his wife Sarah would bring blessing to so many people. This was God's promise. And then the deliverance at the Red Sea, the deliverance of God's people when the waters were parted and the people went from slavery to freedom. This is who God is, the one who goes and brings us from slavery to freedom. And the promise of salvation in Isaiah, where, where the prophet writes, Ho, everyone who thirsts, come to the waters. And you that have no money, come, buy and eat. Come, buy wine and milk without money or price. The promise in Ezekiel of a new heart and a new spirit from God, where God promises 
Then you will live in the land I gave your ancestors. You will be my people, and I will be your God. These are promises of God over and over again. That, that vision of, of the, the valley of the dry bones in which God breathes new life into the dry bones. One of my favorite texts from childhood, <laughs> it's a strange one for a kid to have as a favorite, the, the recounting of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. I don't know if you remember this one. They're faithful to God. They are faithful to God even when the government says, <coughs> you're not allowed to be faithful to God. They're faithful to God and they bow down and they worship God. And because of that, there's a great cost. They get thrown into a fiery furnace. But the furnace, oh, not just a fiery furnace, but one that is not like the fire I had five minutes ago, but like this fire where it's burning. They, they stoked the fire ten times and ten times again so that it would be very clear that this fire was stoked to put an end to these three, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. But then when the fire dies down and they open the furnace, there they are, untouched, unharmed, the three emerge, protected by God. They're tossed into the fire for that very act of praise. And then what do they do when the fire doesn't consume them? They praise God. The even greater power of God that they've now seen in their own life. And then there's the familiar story to us all, the deliverance of Jonah. And the deliverance of Jonah from the belly of the whale or the fish... The deliverance of Jonah, when Jonah was doing what? Jonah was doing exactly what God told him not to do. Not to do. God said, go there. Jonah went there. Now, God sent the big fish to get him over here. But God delivers him. And sometimes being delivered by God looks like being puked up by a fish on the beach in a place you don't want to be. That's deliverance too. But the interesting thing about Jonah is that when Jonah was going away from God, before the big fish, he's on a boat. And he's on this boat and there's a storm that threatens the boat. It threatens to destroy the boat. And the other people on the boat, the other people on the boat hear about what he's done, that he's gone away from God. These are not God-fearing people, but in a storm, everybody's a God-fearing person all of a sudden, right? And so in the midst of this storm, when, when all of a sudden everyone's a God-fearing person, they realize that the one who turned against God is probably the one causing this. And so they throw him into the sea. And so that fish that looks like it's being used to fix God's purpose, to get Jonah where he needs to be, there's something more to the story. Because that fish is delivering Jonah from the peril that his, that his situation put him in and that those people who threw him overboard caused. The prophet Zephaniah praises God and writes this. The Lord your God is in your midst, a warrior who gives victory. He will rejoice over you with gladness. He will renew you in his love. He will exult over you with loud singing as on a day of festival. I will remove disaster from you so that you will not bear reproach for it. I will deal with all your oppressors at that time, and I will save the lame and gather the outcast, and I will change their shame into praise and renown in all the earth. At that time, I will bring you home, at the time when I gather you, for I will make you renowned and praised among all the peoples of the earth when I restore your fortunes before your eyes, says the Lord." That's who our God is. 
I will make you renowned and praised among the peoples of the earth when I restore your fortunes before your eyes, says the Lord. On this Easter morning, let us listen from John's Gospel, chapter 20. Early on the first day of the week, while it was still dark, Mary Magdalene came to the tomb and saw that the stone had been removed from the tomb. So she ran and went to Simon Peter and the other disciple, the one whom Jesus loved, and said to them, they have taken the Lord out of the tomb, and we do not know where they have laid him. Then Peter and the other disciples set out and went toward the tomb. The two were running together, but the other disciple outran Peter and reached the tomb first. He bent down to look in and saw the linen wrappings lying there, but he did not go in. Then Simon Peter came following him, and went into the tomb. He saw the linen wrappings lying there, and the cloth that had been on Jesus' head, not lying with the linen wrappings, but rolled up in a place by itself. Then the other disciple who reached the tomb first also went in, and he saw and believed. For as yet they did not understand the scripture that he must rise from the dead. Then the disciples returned to their homes. But Mary stood weeping outside the tomb. As she wept, she bent over to look into the tomb, and she saw two angels in white sitting where the body of Jesus had been lying, one at the head and the other at the feet. They said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? She said to them, They have taken away my Lord, and I do not know where they have laid him. When she said, said this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing there, but she did not know it was Jesus. Jesus said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? Whom are you looking for? Supposing him to be the gardener, she said to him, Sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you have laid him, and I will take him away. Jesus said to her, Mary. She turned and said to him in Hebrew, Rabuni, which means teacher. Jesus said to her, Do not hold on to me, because I have not yet ascended to the Father. But go to my brothers and say to them, I am ascending to my Father and your Father, to my God and your God. Mary Magdalene went and announced to the disciples, I have seen the Lord. And she told them that he had said these things to her. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. You know, all of those texts that we looked at from the Old Testament, all of those recountings of what God had done, Mary Magdalene knew all of those things. She not only knew them, they were a part of Jesus' teachings, they were a part of of the Jewish life, of over and over again recounting God's deliverance and God's blessings and the way that God loved God's people. And so when, when Mary Magdalene approaches that empty tomb, she brings with her all of that knowledge and that experience. But she also brings with her the promises that Jesus made to her, the promises that Jesus makes to each one of us that God's promises are continuing, that God will continue in the life of Mary to be with her, continue to be seen. And so on Easter, as we gather, we gather to celebrate the risen Lord. <clears throat> we gather to celebrate the risen Lord who continues to reign in glory and to rise in glory in our lives. 
But even for us, marking this Easter, Easter is not the beginning of our relationship with God, right? It's a, it's a point on the way every year. One of the ways that we acknowledge who God is in our lives is through the sacrament of baptism. Hear these words from the letter to the Romans, chapter 6, verses 3 through 11. Do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? Therefore, we have been buried with him by baptism into death. Now, that text has always surprised me a little bit. We don't think of baptism as death, do we? We think of baptism as life. We, we in our tradition, often, most often, baptize the young, the babies, the infants. And so it's a, it's a continuation almost of the birth story, right? You're born, and then very soon thereafter, you're baptized. But baptism is our uniting with Christ in his death because therefore we have been buried with him by baptism into death so that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, so we too might walk in newness of life. Because to die with Christ means to be raised with Christ. For if we have been united with him in a death like his, we will certainly be united with him in a resurrection like his. We know that our old self was crucified with him so that the body of sin might be destroyed and we might no longer be enslaved to sin. For whoever has died is freed from sin. But if we have died with Christ, we believe that we will also live with him. We know that Christ being raised from the dead will never die again. Death no longer has dominion over him. The death he died, he died to sin once for all. But the life he lives, he lives to God. So you also must consider yourselves dead to sin and alive to God in Jesus Christ. This is the good news. And so, for us too, today, we remember our baptism. Our baptism when we were united with Christ and united with Christ's resurrection power. Just as the body is one and has many members, and all the members of the body, though many, are one body, so it is with Christ. In the one spirit, we are all baptized into one body. We are the body of Christ and individually members of it. With the whole church, let us confess our faith using a responsive declaration of faith based on the Apostles' Creed. Do you believe in God the Father? I believe in God the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. Do you believe in Jesus Christ, Son of God? I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day he rose again, he ascended into heaven, he is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. Do you believe in God the Holy Spirit? I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Let us pray. Eternal and gracious God, we give you thanks. In countless ways you have revealed yourself in ages past and have blessed us with signs of your grace. We praise you that through the waters of the sea you led your people Israel out of bondage into freedom in the land of your promise. We praise you for sending Jesus, your son, who, was for, us, who for us was baptized in the waters of the Jordan and was anointed as Christ by your Holy Spirit. Through the baptism of his death and resurrection, you set us free from the bondage of sin and death and give us cleansing and rebirth. 
We praise you for your Holy Spirit who teaches us and leads us into all truth, filling us with a variety of gifts that we might proclaim the gospel to all nations and serve you as a royal priesthood. We rejoice, rejoice that, that you claimed us, us in our baptism, baptism and that, that by, by your grace we are, are born anew. anew. By your Holy Spirit, renew us that we may be empowered to do your will and continue forever in the risen life of Christ, to whom with you and the Holy Spirit be all glory and honor now and forever. Amen. Amen. Want to pour it? You pour. Mm -hmm. Get a little extra for you. I'll stand back. <laughs> Remember your baptism and be thankful. Remember your baptism and be thankful. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. In the name of the Father Amen. and the Son Remember and the Holy Spirit. Remember your baptism Spirit. and be faithful. Remember your baptism and be thankful. Remember your baptism and In the name of the thankful. Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Remember your baptism and be Remember thankful. Remember your baptism and be thankful. In the Remember name of the Father, and, be and of the Son, hello, and of the Holy Spirit. Well, Remember your baptism and be Remember thankful. Remember your baptism it's raining and be for thankful. You. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Remember Holy Spirit. Remember your baptism and be thankful. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Remember your baptism and be thankful. Remember your baptism In the name of the and Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Remember your, Remember baptism, your baptism, and baptism and be thankful and be in the thankful. name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. I got you guys. Remember your baptism and be thankful in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. If you're at home, we didn't get to sprinkle you, but take a bowl of water and give yourself a little splash. And remember your baptism and be thankful in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let us pray. Gracious God, by water and the Spirit, you claimed us as your own, cleansing us from sin and giving us new life. You made us members of your body, the church, calling us to be your servants in the world. Renew in us the covenant you made in our baptism. Continue the good work you have begun in us. Send us forth by the power of your Holy Spirit to love and serve you with joy and to strive for justice and peace in all the earth. In the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Amen. Friends, having been reminded of our baptism, having been reminded of who God is in our lives, and having been reminded that we are made one with God through the resurrection, friends, I encourage you to pass the peace of Christ to one another. You can use your, your bell, and you can use your sounds, and you can use your uh, nods and bows, however you like, but offer greetings. Make eye contact with those around you. Peace be with you. Peace. Peace, brother. If you're watching online, I encourage you to offer a sign of peace to those that are worshiping with you in the, in the chat area, and also send texts, send messages of love. People will wake up to your greetings of Easter blessings. And we're so glad that you've been here with us on this day.
peace, brother. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Hallelujah. <laughs> Go in peace to love and serve the Lord in the power of his resurrection. Amen. Christ is risen. Christ is risen. Christ is risen. <laughs> Christ is risen. Christ is risen indeed. Alleluia. Amen. 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 Go in peace, friends. And remember, we'll worship again at 9.30 a.m. on the live stream with wonderful music from our brass and from our choir and from our musicians. You can open up. It's, but I don't want to tell the people on the live stream what's in there. Yeah, but go ahead. Okay. Have a good day. Happy Easter. It is. Okay. Yeah, so just mute it.